with support from the Climate Kick Alumni Association. Welcome to The Elephant. I'm Kevin Kainers. This will change the Great Barrier Reef forever. We're seeing huge levels of bleaching in the northern thousand kilometer stretch of the Great Barrier Reef. The sheer scale of coral bleaching is revealed in footage shot for a scientific survey last week. For over a thousand kilometres from Cairns to the Torres Strait, the once colourful ribbons of reef are a ghostly white. Leading this expedition is one of Australia's... That's a clip from a recent ABC News report on the bleaching occurring right now on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, where, according to aerial surveys, a staggering 93% of the reefs have been hit by bleaching. According to scientists, this episode is by far the worst that has ever happened in recorded history. And these bleaching events mean vast portions of the coral reefs will die. Uh, now, I, I wouldn't like to estimate how much of the, the total Great Barrier Reef we're going to lose in this event, but I think it's going to be uh, heartbreakingly high. And it's not just the Great Barrier Reef that's bleaching right now. Coral reefs worldwide are being hit by similar events. Probably only a small number of us have ever had the chance to see coral reefs close up in person. But almost all of us, I would wager, have at least seen snippets from nature documentaries, where we see the incredible colors and abundance of coral reef habitats, how they support an almost unimaginable diversity of fishes, plants, and marine species of all sizes and shapes. They're truly one of the most amazing ecosystems on Earth. And they're so important that at least one third of all species in the ocean at least partly depend on them. Coral bleaching occurs when water temperatures become abnormally hot for long periods of time. And what's happening right now with reefs worldwide is directly connected to climate change. Scientists have long been warning us for more than two decades that damages to our oceans and the death of coral reefs worldwide would likely be the first tipping points that we would experience because of climate change. And after years of ignoring them, we're now starting to see those warnings come to fruition. My guest today is Professor Justin Marshall of the University of Queensland. He's the founder of the nonprofit Coral Watch and the co-author of the book, Coral Reefs and Climate Change. And for Professor Marshall and the other scientists whose work revolves around studying the reefs, what's happening right now is no less than heartbreaking. I'm, I'm personally devastated by the whole thing. I'm studying a dying system, and that's very depressing. It's, um, it's not where I wanted to be. It's not what I wanted to hand on to my children. And perhaps what's even sadder about this whole event, given that this die-off is directly connected with climate change, is that while this bleaching event is going on, the Australian government is moving forward with plans to allow the development in Queensland of what will be, if built, the world's largest coal mine. This coal mine will have an area the same size as Ireland. It will emit as much carbon as a small country. It will knock the final nails in the coffin of the Great Barrier Reef, undoubtedly and it will contribute to killing other reefs worldwide. Here's my conversation with Professor Justin Marshall. I reached him by phone in Brisbane. Well, Justin Marshall, welcome to The Elephant. I want to get to what's going on right now with the the coral reefs and how it's connected to climate change. But first, for those of us who've never seen coral reefs close up, I was wondering if you could tell us what it's actually like when they're healthy to experience them, to to dive with them. What do you see? What's it like? Sure. Um, It is an amazing environment. It's the most diverse and colorful environment on the planet. Um, We think of forests and rainforests being full of colorful birds and colorful animals. Uh, In fact, even a a rainforest is, um, it's it's green and brown and lovely and there's flowers, but there's only a, a few birds here and there. One of the things that really sets reefs apart is that in a very small area, There's a tremendous number of living organisms. Uh, Many of them are very colorful, and those colors actually help them survive. Um, So really, it's the most colorful and vibrant habitat on the planet. Do you remember the first time that you saw coral reefs close up? I do. I was uh, five or six, I think. I was clinging to my father's back as he set out across the reef, and I was terrified. I looked down, and I could see big fish or you know what i thought were big fish they have no idea what size they were probably um, half a meter long or something um, and i could see all this rocky colorful stuff uh, so i stuck my face in the water and then out again and in and out and after a while i just had my face in the water and glued to what was going on uh, because there was so much going on i mean it's one of the big surprises 
when people start to dive or snorkel, you, you stand above the water and there is this surface in front of you. But then as soon as you put your head under the surface and become comfortable with breathing, either through the snorkel tube or through the aqualung, uh, what's underwater is, is really mind-blowing in terms of its um, diversity. And so was it an instant affinity for you that you got to love the, the coral? I think so. I mean, I, I, I sometimes say I've been a marine biologist since I was two. Um, I, I was lucky enough to have parents who were marine scientists and they went around the world and took me with them. And there's always been, uh, you know, bottles of pickled fish in the house. Um, my mother was a, a natural history illustrator, so she would paint the fish that my father studied. So it's just as if I've always been in a fish uh, tank my entire life. So yes, it was natural for me to want to get out there and understand what was there in more detail, and I've been doing it ever since. So when we you know, hear about coral reefs and like the Great Barrier Reef, I, don't, I think most of us don't really, we understand that it's this rich habitat, but we're, we're not quite sure what it is in, in some regards. What is coral? Well, coral is, um, it's, with the Great Barrier Reef, for instance, it's the largest living structure uh, on the planet. It's viewable from space. Um, coral itself is actually a single coral polyp or a single organism is quite small so it's remarkable that these small animals have managed to build such a structure now individually um, a polyp is uh, a little bit like an upside down jellyfish or it's a, a little bit like a small anemone um, so it's a it's one of the animals which construct its body mainly from um, from gelatinous like material however uh, coral has managed to settle out on the bottom and work out a way to extract um, calcium carbonate from the water. So it then builds a skeleton within which it can live. So what we see when we go into a shop, for instance, and there is, uh, let's say, jewelry draped over a beautiful coral uh, skeleton, what we're seeing there is a uh, dried out and probably um, bleached white uh, skeleton of the coral. So it's the, it's the calcium carbonate that the polyps leave behind. Each one of those coral heads contains hundreds or thousands of individual polyps. So it's, a, it's a, a community of animals that live together. And the different coral species have built these coral reefs around the world, um, of which the Great Barrier Reef is the biggest. Um, so it's remarkable that they've managed to do, to do this in such a short space of time. And so are the polyps completely stationary then? Most of them are. There's a few, there are a few, the, the fungids, the, the fungus-like corals, which can move around a little bit. But most of them are essentially glued to the substrate. In fact, that's what they do. They, they, um, they fasten themselves to the substrate when the, uh, the coral lava settles out on the reef. And they then grow and look a bit like a plant. So someone looking out over a coral reef might be forgiven for thinking that what they're seeing are, are beautiful branches of some sort of underwater plant. Um, and they take on different forms. There are branching forms, there are forms that, that fan out in plates, look a bit like um, big leaves or something. So again, a naive observer, someone going to the reef for the first time, uh, might think these are all plants. Uh, in fact, they're these colonial animals, um, which also, like plants, take advantage of the sunlight. So what's happening right now? Uh, right now, um, unfortunately, we're in the middle of... Uh, the third world coral reef bleach and probably well no i think certainly the worst massive reef bleach that we've seen ever now these bleaching events have only started since uh about 20 years ago the first one was in 1998 um, in that year because of the bleach and because of the, the stress that the coral was put under we lost around 16 percent of all reefs worldwide um, the bleach that we're seeing right now, um, it, it will take some time to, to work out similar figures, but um, I believe, and my, my other uh, coral scientist colleagues also believe that it will be the worst bleach we've seen. It's, it's certainly the longest bleach that we've seen. And that means that corals are now um, dying off at an alarming rate. Um, certainly in the, the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, um, I think we've already lost half of that large section of reef. And so, so what is bleaching? What's actually going on? Yeah, what, what's going on there? So 
it's called bleaching because when you look at a coral, it, it turns white. It looks as if it's been bleached. Now, a healthy coral, um, a healthy uh, colony of corals or a healthy reef actually looks mostly brown and green. So if you look on a reef, um, it's quite rare to see bright colors. The bright colors are provided by the sponges, a few of the corals and many of the fish and other animals that live there. But a healthy reef is a little bit like a forest. It looks green. Um, and it's actually green for the same reason that a forest is green. So forests are green because the, the plants have, uh, have chlorophyll. They have chloroplasts within the cells. And these uh, organelles manage to trap sunlight, um, to use air, and to make carbohydrates uh, from the carbon dioxide in air and um, a mechanism of photosynthesis. Coral, although it's an animal, takes on board little algal cells, so little plant-like cells within their tissues, and they form a symbiotic relationship, so-called, where the algae provides the coral with nutrients through photosynthesis, and the coral provides the algae with um, protein from feeding on, on zooplankton and protection. This is a relationship that's been going on for thousands of years. It's very successful. But when coral bleaches, um, for a number of reasons, those symbiotic algae either break down, die, or are expelled. And that means that the green and brown uh, veil of algae, if you like, that lies over the coral is taken away. And what we see is either uh, a very bright white or sometimes, sometimes beautiful uh, fluorescent colors, so really uh, day glow colors, uh, which are the colors of the polyp in the background coming out. So the coral loses its, its symbiont, becomes highly stressed, uh, bleaches, so-called, and may then either die off, depending on how stressed it's been, or uh, embark on a long road to recovery and regrowing its symbiotic algae. And so the, the coral can't survive on its own. It, ne it needs the, the symbiotic relationship. That's right. I mean, there are a few deep water corals that don't have this relationship, um, and they do survive on their own. Um, but the surface living corals up in the, the surface waters um, can't survive on their own for long. Um, they need the, the symbiont to provide them with, with nutrients and energy. And if they can't regrow them, if they can't re-sequester uh, them from the water, then yes, they, they die and they get covered in a, uh, a competitive mat of algae. So the larger algae on the reef, the larger uh, seaweeds, essentially, uh, seaweed takes over the reef. So you end up with a, a reef that's no longer corals, but a, a reef which is... Uh, a comparative ugly, um, not so pretty reef of seaweed. And so, is this bleaching? Is it does it happen directly because of, of temperatures in the water? Yeah, that's right. Um, bleaching happens when coral becomes too hot for too long. Um, now, because of you know the, the ocean is tidal, and sometimes coral is expo exposed to the air, and sometimes uh, rock pools that you find coral in can heat up a lot. Uh, so, coral can put up with high temperature for a short space of time under these conditions. However, when the temperature rises um, too high for too long, uh, and that rise may be only be one or two degrees different, um, then the coral becomes stressed and it, it loses its symbiont and it, and it bleaches. And this uh, rise in temperature is being driven by carbon emissions. So global warming, so-called, is what's responsible for the coral bleaches that we've seen for the last 20 years. And how do we how do we know it's global warming? I mean, it, this is an El Nino year, which has gotten a lot yeah. of attention. And what, yeah. Why do, do we know it's not just that? That's, I mean, that's a good question, uh, and it's definitely associated with El Nino. So, um, the, the the fact that tells us it's not just a natural El Nino fluctuation is that El Ninos have been happening for um, thousands of years. I, I'm not sure what the age of the current weather cycles are on Earth, but these have been going on for. For many years, as you say, they're natural. Every seven years or so, there's a reversal in, in world temperature. Um, some areas stay hot for longer. But we've only been seeing mass coral bleaching of the sort that we're seeing now for 20 years. Uh, they correlate extremely strongly with um, the increase in uh, global temperatures. And they do fall often on, um, on El Nino years because you get a, a, an additive effect. So there is the underlying uh, effect of global warming, then when there's an El Nino on top of that, the coral bleaches. But the bleaches we're seeing are definitely not uh, just caused by El Nino. And many 
people try and um, use that as an excuse. That is not the case. It is undoubtedly correlated to anthropogenic or anthropocentric, you know, man-made uh, temperature increases on the planet. And, and so I know you, you mentioned some, some numbers before, but w so what, what is the scale of the current die-off? You say this is, this is the biggest bleaching event that we know of? Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, I'll give you some numbers for the Great Barrier Reef first. So the, you know, the Great Barrier Reef is around 3,000 kilometers long. You know, it's this huge uh, structure the size of Italy, essentially, that stretches down the side of uh, the eastern, northeastern side of Australia. Uh, the top third of that reef um, has bleached extremely heavily. Uh, probably 95% of the reefs or the corals on those reefs have bleached. Um, what we're seeing now as the temperature of the water has, has decreased is we're seeing whether or not those corals are recovering. And current estimates are that probably less than 50% of those corals will recover because of the severity of the bleach in that area. Uh, this is a great shame because that area of the reef was the least uh, touched. It, it's the most remote. There are not many um, towns up and down the coast there. There's comparatively little shipping. Um, you know, previous activities have been quite um, you know, reduced in that area. Uh, the southern two-thirds of the Great Barrier Reef has also bleached to, to some extent, but less, less so. So, for instance, I went out to the reef last weekend um, to an area that was only 50% bleached. But, again, you, you, see, you hear no, uh, news reports that the, the bottom two-thirds of the Great Barrier Reef is fine. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, it's still highly stressed. It's still bleaching, but just less so. So... Uh, now, I, I wouldn't like to estimate how much of the, the total Great Barrier Reef we're going to lose in this event, but I think it's going to be uh, heartbreakingly high. Um, but then let's not forget this is not just the Great Barrier Reef. In fact, most of the coral reefs around the world are bleaching now. It is a global event. Um, some reefs have bleached two years in a row, in the Caribbean, for instance. Some reefs are just beginning to bleach, so the, the coral triangle reefs in Indonesia, which are the, the world's best and best preserved, most biodiverse reefs, are beginning to bleach now. So this is a global phenomenon. It's not something confined to Australia. Uh, and that, again, underlies the fact that as a global community, we need to move to renewable energy as fast as possible, as much faster than we're, we're saying we're going to. We need to stop burning fossil fuels. We need to stop emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Otherwise, uh, the future that we're looking at is no reef within 40 years. You said you saw them up up close uh, in the southern portion. Uh, I I went uh, out to the reef. In fact, with our uh, state, the state of Queensland environment minister, um, uh, last weekend, and 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 snorkeled on the reef. Saw the the corals up close. Um, three weeks before that, I spent ten days up on Lizard Island, um, which is a uh, a beautiful spot in the northern section of the reef with a research station run by the Australian Museum. Um, and that's when I began, began to become really concerned because I, amongst others, noticed this 95% bleach of the reefs. Uh, I sent back many photographs. Um, uh, I have a Dropbox site, which anyone is welcome to go to if they want to, to see and witness what's going on there. Um, and we can provide more information through a, a citizen science group that I run called Coral Watch. So it's www.coralwatch, all one word, um, dot org. Um, if anyone's interested, go there and we can provide more information. Uh, but yes, I've seen this up close uh, in person and um, I'm, uh, I'm personally devastated by the whole thing. I, I, I've worked on reefs for 30 years and I'm basically looking at the end of my career very soon. Be because of the die-off or because you're going to retire? Uh, because of the die-off. Now, I've got another 20 years ahead of me. Um, I guess I'll spend the next 20 years you know, doing my best to encourage people to do better in terms of environmental stewardship and studying the remaining animals, but I'm studying a dying system. Um, and that's very depressing. It's, um, it's not where I wanted to be. It's not what I wanted to hand on to my children. You know, I wanted to... I have two kids. I take them to the reef. Uh, we've been there, we've been to Lizard Island before and it's, it was a wonderful place. Uh, right now, if I took my kids there, I, I would be ashamed to show them what's going on. 
You, you were you recently accompanied David Admiral on as he he filmed uh, his latest series on the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. Was was it being damaged then too? Could you was the bleaching already occurring? Uh, no, the bleaching wasn't happening then. So that was you know the series has just screened in in some countries. Uh, it's actually just screening in Australia right now. It's um, we had episode one on Sunday. It's a three episode series. It was a it was a great privilege. It was wonderful to work with Sir David Attenborough, who is. Um, you know, one of the world's best communicators of uh, of nature. He's he's been doing this for over 60 years. Um, he was visiting the reef again after diving there for for the first time 60 years ago, and we took him down in a submersible. Um, I was his guide for some of that journey. Um, we went in the submersible together, and we visited reefs in and around Lizard Island and in and around the Great Barrier Reef. And the reef then was was still beautiful. Um, there were some areas that were impacted by recent cyclones and other recent bleaches, um, and that was obvious, perhaps, to the trained eyes of the marine, marine scientists. But we certainly managed to film uh, you know, beautiful life, and uh, Sir David and his team, you know, Atlantic Productions, did a great job of showing the world the wonderful um, side of, the great, of, of reef systems and the life that lives there. Uh, it's unfortunately a fact that most of the corals and most of the reef that I showed Sir David is now dead or dying. So what we have there is a history lesson, not a natural history lesson. Um, so when you watch that documentary series, um, a lot of what you see on the television is not there anymore. I mean, you mentioned how tough it is for you to, to see this thing you've, worked, you've spent your entire life working on dying. I guess, what is it like for you and your colleagues in general? Um, yeah, uh, it's the same. I've, I've got um, part of my, my team, my lab is up there at the moment, six people up there studying fish and trying to come to grips with the fact that the fish population is going to die off as well. Um, they were watching the reef yesterday. They're in tears. They're sending back reports of you know, an eerie reef full of um, no life. Uh, we're all basically crying about it it's it's a, a deeply upsetting experience would, would you say we should be angry about this or sad well both i mean it, it is you know for me it's a grieving process i've gone through well i go through sad every day i'm i'm deeply angry i'm very angry that not that this is something which we've been predicting reporting for over 20 years uh, 30 years for some of us have been saying reefs are in trouble we need to do something about it um as scientists, we say this over and over again. It's reported in the press, you know, briefly, and people go, "Oh, there's a problem," and then it's on to the next thing. It's you know, the football match is more important. Uh, we've been uh, sometimes screaming about this to local politicians. Um, uh, we've said it to uh, you know the Australian federal government uh, over and over again. And um, as I'm sure many people listening to this will remember, uh, finally last year in Paris. Many countries, over 190 countries, I think, agreed that yes, there is a problem in terms of uh, man-made global climate change and we need to do something about that. Uh, unfortunately, what the Australian government then did was come back to Australia um, with a very poor emissions commitment and secondly, open the world's largest, or sign papers to open, the world's largest coal mine in Queensland, right next door to the Great Barrier Reef. This coal mine will have an area the same size as Ireland uh, in Great Britain. Um, it will emit as much carbon as a small country. It will finally knock the final nails in the, in the uh, coffin of the Great Barrier Reef, undoubtedly, both for local and global um, reasons. And moreover, it will contribute to killing other reefs worldwide. You know, when we sell carbon to other countries, when we sell coal to other countries, we must not forget this is a global problem. It doesn't just go out of the country and disappear from here. We cannot think that we're somehow passing that on to someone else as a problem. Uh, we are a global community. We need to act more like a global community. And I would certainly encourage our federal government, um, first of all, to admit this is a, uh, an environmental crisis. They haven't done that yet. But secondly, to move towards renewable energy much faster than they are doing. You said you, you you saw the reefs with uh, Greg Hunt, the environmental, uh, the minister of the oh, environment. No, not, yeah, not Greg Hunt. So Greg Hunt is the federal minister. We have oh, okay. state uh, ministers as well. So Stephen Miles is the state, Queensland state, 
Minister for the Environment. Um, I would say, without putting words in his mouth, that he is in a difficult position. Um, it, you know, his state government has signed papers to open this mine. The federal government has signed papers to open the mine. Having spoken to him, I know that he is very concerned about many aspects of the environment in Queensland, and I know that he is very concerned about uh, the reef in particular. So he's struggling to, to work out ways or to work on ways in which to to deal with this in a political uh, environment, which I, I don't think he um, fully agrees with. Well, I, I'd like to ask you about Greg Hunt uh, anyways, because I saw a couple news clips. There was one that you were in on that was on ABC where the you and the other scientists are saying this is this is devastating. Um, and he seems pretty optimistic. He says, oh, we we think it can recover and a lot of it is OK. So so what do you make of his position? Uh, it's completely incorrect. And it's based on adv- advice or facts which are incorrect. Um, and it's, it's actually very insulting to the Australian people. I think that he hasn't taken on board uh, the full depth of what's going on. Um, you know, and maybe he does believe that there's a small number of scientists who are jumping up and down and trying to make a big a big thing out of a small thing, but I'm afraid that's not the case. And as more and more facts and figures come out, he needs to accept that this is much greater than he might have already thought. Uh, some of the statements he's made about the southern two-thirds of the reef being fine, as I mentioned before, are incorrect. Uh, it's not fine. It is bleaching. I was there just a few days ago. It's better. You know, it's definitely better than the northern third. And that's fortunate for the tourism operators because Many of the uh, tourism sites that people, now many people from Germany come to the Great Barrier Reef, many of the sites that they visit are still okay. They're not as wonderful as they were 30 years ago when I first visited. But, you know, let's not say in this interview that the Great Barrier Reef is still not worth visiting. It is absolutely worth visiting. Um, And, you know, Greg Hunt is correct in saying that. So the reef is definitely a great tourist site still. But if we continue to insult it, as we are doing so, and if his government doesn't get their act together much faster than they're doing, that Great Barrier Reef is going to disappear, you know, possibly within my lifetime. Um, and you know, one of the things that talks to these guys is the fact that we, our tourism industry here uh, in Queensland is a $6 billion industry every year, and it has 70,000 jobs riding on the reef in various aspects. So those are the sorts of things he needs to start thinking about um, when he opens his mouth and comes out with with facts and figures that are bluntly incorrect. And so is the federal government in favor of this uh, new gigantic coal mine? Absolutely. I mean, for them, it's it's all about jobs, immediate jobs and immediate profit. Um, I'm not sure who's driving it, whether it's them or particularly the, the Queensland government, who are, again, very concerned with jobs. Now, these, these are the sorts of things that, that politicians think about because it wins them votes. You know, are we going to get some new jobs? Yes, we are. That means we'll get some new votes. Well, stack up the figures here. So that mine, they predict, will employ 5,000 people. As I just mentioned, there are 70,000 jobs riding on reef tourism in Queensland. So are they really willing to gamble a few thousand jobs against tens of thousands of jobs? This doesn't make sense to me. Look at the the profit from that mine. It's predicted to be $4 billion a year or something like that. I'm I'm not certain of the figures, but... Tourism is certainly close, closer to $6 billion. They seem to be taking a great gamble. They're basing this gamble on facts that they don't understand and that they misquote and misrepresent. Um, so they need to th- take a step backwards and think harder about uh, their policies and what they're pushing through. Uh, because what they're pushing through right now is certain death for the Great Barrier Reef. So what do you think accounts for this cognitive dissonance? Because you know, if we're to take seriously what, you know, even the Australian government committed to in Paris, uh, let alone all the other governments, um, it's clear that, you know, to build new coal mines is, is madness. We need to be getting off coal as soon as possible if we're to have any chance of, of staying under two degrees. Yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting question. It's um, And it's one that I think was discussed in detail in Paris is there is a dissonance, there's a disconnect, there is a uh, there is a lack of understanding, or I think, of the urgency which um, we need to act with. And a number of people said that the Paris meeting was both a tremendous triumph, but also a tremendous failure. It was a triumph because, you know, finally the world did agree that we were going to do something. It was a failure because we did not agree to do enough. And one of the great dangers of that Paris meeting is that it sent a signal to the world that, 
okay, the politicians now have this in hand and we can sit back and wait for the right thing to happen. As has clearly been demonstrated in Australia since then, uh, we cannot. And the real hard work started as soon as that Paris meeting was finished. Um, and that's certainly the case here. We've, it's really difficult to make uh, the federal government here understand that we are right in the middle of an environmental crisis. Again, they haven't admitted that yet. Uh, and we need to get off coal sooner than as soon as possible. I, mean, I, I have many uh, German colleagues. I've been to Germany a number of times. I have tremendous admiration for what the German people are trying to do in terms of renewable energy. Now, individual houses have a number of different solutions. Uh, there are subsidies for these which in Australia are very slow to come through. Uh, we put solar panels on our house in the year that the subsidies for solar panels were removed. So the government here is really not serious about renewable energy. They, you know, they'd like to think they are, they put some money into it, but um, when you stack that up against their seriousness in terms of selling coal to other countries, um, it, it's just, as you say, there's a dissonance, there's a disconnect, there's a, an urgency which they don't seem to realize. And do you, do you think that's re reflected in the general public in Australia too? Do, or do you think the general public has more of a sense of the urgency? I think they do. I mean, Australian public are actually very connected to their environment. Um, Australians love to go camping. They love to be outside. It's a great outdoor nation. They love the environment. Uh, and I think many people do recognize that there is a problem. Um, you know, most Australians, I think if you said, you know, do you know about climate change? They'd say yes. Um, and they'd probably be able to provide a pretty good description of, of what's going on. Um, I'm not sure, again, that they recognize the urgency with which I think that we need to act. Um, and it, you know, I think that's that's really come through in this in this reef bleach. Um, a number of people have called reefs, you know, the canary in the coal mine. Now that expression means you know, it's an early warning system. It's a way of uh, warning the planet that something's going on. And reefs, because they are one of the ecosystems that suffers first, seem to be this early warning system. The system has been going off for 20 years at least. We don't seem to be taking that warning on board. Um, so I'm not sure how to get through to the public the urgency of what's going on, but certainly the misinformation that we get from um, the federal politicians here and the misinformation that is driven through the mainstream press in Australia for a variety of reasons is certainly not helping uh, in swaying the public one way or the other. So you know, although Australians are very concerned about their environment, I'm not sure that, um, let's say, that they're concerned enough. You know, one of the things that one often hears um, if you're trying to communicate climate change or advice that scientists get is, you know, don't scare people. Don't don't be too doomsday about it because that yeah. will get lead to people being feeling paralyzed and like it's too late. Yeah. And I'm wondering how you feel about that or if that's like a difficult position to be in, because this is what we're experiencing now is, is as, you, as you say, it's it's devastating. It's um, it, it's dying. Um, one of the great structures on Earth is dying. So I, I, I'm wondering how you deal with that. It should never be doom and gloom. I mean, this is, it's a phrase used by essentially the denialists and the people that want to label um, scientists that come forward with information as, as bad. You know, we're labeled doom and gloom. And isn't this terrible? It's all doomsday. And, you know, um, all the messages we get from the scientists are doom. And just, it's just ignore them and hope it goes away. That's very irresponsible. It's a, it's a sort of name throwing exercise. Uh, you know, think about a forest. We see forests uh, cut down. Uh, we see forests scraped off the surface of the planet. If we stop doing that and replant the forest, it will come back. These, these um, uh, plants, these animals, coral reefs in particular, are tremendously resilient. And if we were to suddenly stop tomorrow doing what we're doing, which is bad, and do things which are good, they will come back. And they'll come back rapidly. Um, you know, I would say that if, if we could stop global warming tomorrow, if we had no more uh, reef bleaches, if we did all of the local things at a local level, which are nice to the reef, um, then the Great Barrier Reef would be back to uh, a very high level of diversity within decades. Um, and in terms of, you know, a structure that it's, it's very rapid. So it's not all doom and gloom. It's, you know, it, there are facts there. But if we don't act on those facts, the doom and the gloom will get worse. Um, so, that, you know, the real doom and gloom people are the people that refuse to act 
uh, the people that are calling us names, they are the, the harbingers of this doom. It is in their hands. Uh, we're the people providing the information, um, providing the advice, uh, and providing the optimism in the end. We're the people saying, let's stop do it, stop doing it, and we'll help the reef get better. As scientists, there's a number of things we can do uh, potentially to help that process along. So, you know, no, I, I push back against the label of doom and gloom. Um, I think that, in a way, belongs to the, the other people. Um, reefs will come back if we give them a chance. Just to play devil's advocate, you know, most of us who don't live in Australia or, or the tropics will spend our lives and we'll, we'll never see a, a coral reef close up. So I was wondering, for those of us who, who will never be anywhere close to, to one, why should we care? Why does this have greater importance? And the part that's mm -hmm. worst off, as you yeah. say, is, is very far away from, from human civilization. There's only a few towns uh, close by. Yeah. So, so why, why should we care? So the part of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is worst off, is, as, as I mentioned, is, is far away. Um, and yes, you know, if that dies tomorrow, um, it's a great shame. Does it really matter? Uh, there are sort of two levels on this. So though, you know, those people that never get to see a reef, um, they may still experience the wonder of the reef and you know, rejoice in the fact that nature is beautiful. Um, you know, you could say the same thing about there are some people that will never get to see a forest or never get to see a savanna or never get to see you know, Africa, those places where there's lots of wonderful nature. They still get to see it on television. They still get you know, David Attenborough documentaries in front of them. Um, and if those uh, environments disappear, then the documentaries disappear too. That's a very superficial level. Um, and if you drill down into what coral reefs actually mean for the planet, it becomes very rapidly very alarming. So it's a fact that one third of all marine species, not just those we associate with the reef normally, but a third of all marine species spend some of their time, some of their life cycle on or around a coral reef. This includes many of the world's major fisheries. Several of the countries which now have reefs that are starting to bleach, like Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, those areas uh, elsewhere in the Pacific, um, the Caribbean, those countries rely on reef as a primary source of protein. So it's like a farm. Indonesia, for instance, I believe, extracts 60% of the protein eaten by that country from its reef systems. They are deeply worried by what's going on. If they lose their reefs, they're going to somehow have to feed their people from other sources of protein. This is one of the reasons that Australia is seeing increasing numbers of people arriving here by boat. Um, they're beginning to leave what they perceive of as being potentially overcrowded and starving countries. So this is not just a thing that we can sit back and say, oh, it's a shame it's going, but huh, you know, it's something a long way away and it doesn't matter. It affects every one of us. Um, if we want fish on our table in a town in Germany in 10 years' time, we need to look after the reef. If we don't want to have huge migrations of people leaving countries that have lost their reefs to other places in the world, and you know, we know very well in Australia that uh, Europe right now is struggling to deal with refugees. This problem will get worse, not just through war, but through famine. And it's a famine that we drive through not looking after reef systems. So I'd be curious to get your thoughts on like, if we are concerned about the, the reef or we're concerned about what's going on in general, what do you generally ad advise to people? Uh, two things. I mean, the reef, and people often get confused by now, what is actually killing the reef? Well, there are these two factors. There are the, the global factors, which we've just talked about, the um, temperature increase, uh, ocean acidification is another problem. Um, and then there are the, lo the local problems, which include too much shipping, uh, poor farming practice next to reef systems. Um, and basically, we need to do better on both levels. We need to look after reefs in as many possible ways that we can. Right now, we have a hospital patient. We have a patient in a bed in a hospital that is bleeding to death. What we must not do is walk into the hospital and beat the patient with a stick. What we must do is walk into the hospital and feed the patient, encourage it to thrive as much as possible. So in response to your question, that's what we've got to do. We've got to act responsibly at a local and global level uh, in order to encourage this ecosystem to bounce back, as it will if we're nice to it. 
if we continue to either ignore it because reefs are not our concern, they're a nice thing to see on TV, uh, we're going to we're going to be bitten uh, in the behind eventually because, as I mentioned, reefs um, are the source of much of the life in the ocean. They're the source of much of the protein for many countries. So it's not um, just something which is to do with the documentary, which is nice to look at. It has to do with our responsibility for the rest of the world. What What do you think the prognosis is for someone like your son to be able to experience the the reef uh, into his adulthood? Uh, poor. Um, in fact, if you look at the prognosis for the reef, there's a report put out by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority was put out a few years ago. Uh, the word that was used was poor. Um, I was deeply upset. My son is now 12. Uh, six years ago when he was six, he looked at me and said, Daddy, is the reef dying? Um, I had to say, well, yes. And I started crying. Um, yes, it is, um, Ben, and you know, here's why. And this is my message that we need to give to our children. You know, it is dying. It's dying because we have not been good guardians of the environment. And you know, give us your help. What are your thoughts? How can we do better? And I, I really hope that the you know the younger generations coming through act faster than we have. You know, as an adult, as an over 50 year old, I've got to take some responsibility for not acting fast enough. You know, I've been trying in my own little way, but perhaps I haven't been trying hard enough. Um, Barack Obama, the President of the United States, sat with Sir David Attenborough on David's 89th birthday and they talked about a number of things. One of the things they talked about at length was that they both wanted their grandchildren to have the opportunity to visit a reef system somewhere and how much they hope that the world will act very fast to enable that to be the case. At the moment, my prognosis is that it, it will be poor, I think. We're going to struggle to find reef systems for our kids to go to. Um, and, you know, let's sit back in a year's time and see how much of the world's reefs we've lost in this one year, in this uh, probably worst global uh, reef breach that we've ever seen, and reflect on that and do better. Um, you know, maybe by the time their children get to go to a reef, it will be on, on the rise. Um, but as I said earlier, you know, I would, I would have been utterly ashamed to take my son to the reef um, two weeks ago when I went there and show him the way in which those corals are, are dying and growing seaweed all over the top of them, the you know, almost bewildered expressions on the faces of the fish as their homes and their food disappears. Um, we're destroying one of the most beautiful things on the planet and we're just not doing enough about it. What, what do you see your job as, as now going forward? I mean, as you say, this is forcing you to have a, a different job. Essentially. Essentially, yes. You know, I've spent the last month of my life doing something that I'm, I shouldn't have needed to do. Um, and I run this citizen science organization called Coral Watch, in which we encourage anyone to get out there. We have a system where you know, non-scientists can go out. We, they can help us monitor the reefs. We can get uh, as many people as possible out there returning real data using pre-calibrated systems. The thing I'd like most of all is for Coral Watch to disappear. The thing I'd like most of all is for these monitoring systems to not need to be there. We don't we don't, don't need to monitor the reef because it's a wonderful system in the same way as we don't need to monitor many of the forests around the world because it's there, they're there, and they're, they're flourishing. So my job at the moment is, uh, is twofold. I, I study animals on the reef. I've spent a lifetime doing that. Um, I actually study their visual systems and what they actually see primarily. But my job has also become... Uh, a guardian of the reef. Um, I was one of the first people, I think, to to shout loudly about this late, latest bleaching event. And it, it's unfortunate that I have to do that, and I have to continue to do that um, until people begin to sit up and listen to it. Um, so for any of your listeners out there, if you can help spread the word, um, that helps. Uh, you know, talk to people who don't agree. Um, one of the problems that I face as a scientist is we get together at conferences and we all agree there's a problem. We then go home and we've agreed that there's a problem, but we haven't really done anything about it. So it's important to talk to those people that don't agree, uh, those people that will say oh, it's, it's more important to have a mine and we've got prosperity based on that mine. Um, you know, A number of the people up in northern Queensland want this mine, and I totally understand that because it will bring prosperity to their region. There have been headlines in the paper such as, you know, my children can't eat coral. 
That's absolutely true, but my children can't eat coal. You know, how do we how do we resolve this problem of some wanting prosperity through mining, some wanting prosperity through tourism in the reef? Um, for me, because mining is such a short-lived thing, because it's actually destroying the atmosphere, uh, it's a no-brainer. But um, it's very difficult to to talk about these problems and get to a point where we all agree and move forward. What's the outlook uh, on stopping the mine now? Some permits have been approved. So where is it currently at? Um, as I understand it, yes, you're right. You know, permits have been approved, um, but there are still people trying to stop it, both the indigenous folks who are going to lose uh, their native land, uh, and there is a group of environmental lawyers who have taken this on board. Uh, the company which is trying to set the mine in motion, I believe, is having trouble financing the mine. Um, you know, coal mining is becoming less and less profitable. It's becoming less and less acceptable. So I would like to predict that it won't go ahead, um, but I'm not sure because this is not my area. I'm not an economist. I, I don't know. Um, but I'm certainly encouraging the federal government to withdraw those uh, approvals. I'm encouraging the state government to withdraw those approvals. And I'm directly encouraging the mine itself to withdraw, to reconsider what they're doing, to consider that by selling those uh, those fossil fuels to other countries and, and allowing those countries to burn the fossil fuel is still directly killing the Great Barrier Reef. It is also directly killing other reefs around the world. And as I mentioned, that brings with it other humanitarian problems. Um, so they need to think really hard about what they're doing in our world. How long do we expect this current bleaching event to last? Um, it's beginning to finish now. So the, the waters around the reef are cooling down. Um, so what we're seeing is less and less bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, it's beginning to take off in other countries, as I mentioned, but if we concentrate on the Great Barrier Reef, the bleaching is beginning to stop. The water's dropping below 30 degrees centigrade, uh, which is a critical threshold for many corals. Um, and the bleaching has stopped. Uh, what happens now is that either the bleached coral recovers or it, it dies and seaweed takes over, algae takes over. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, um, it unfortunately looks like uh, we're seeing a lot of algal growth. We're seeing a lot of seaweed taking over where normally coral would grow. Um, and this is a, a competitive event. It's like you know plants competing in the forest canopy. Um, but the algae is beginning to outcompete the coral. So what we'll end up with is a, a reef um, based on, on seaweed, not a reef based on corals. And corals support a lot more uh, types of life than, than seaweed. Uh, and eventually, if, if, the, if the seaweed takes over, then the, the skeleton of the coral underneath uh, breaks down and, and dissipates, and the actual structure of the reef will, will dissolve. So once the seaweed takes over, then it, it's the, the end, basically. Uh, it's, it's not the end, but it is very difficult for the coral to come back. It's very difficult for it to outcompete that that seaweed. And again, you know, getting back to some of the comments I've made, we need to give that coral it, its best possible opportunity to to enter the competition again and push back against the seaweed and regrow the areas that it would uh, naturally be found in. As we go forward, what are you looking out for specifically to to see the the extent of the damage? Like, when will we know? Um, so there are a number of surveys underway right now. Uh, my colleagues from the uh, James Cook University in Townsville are undertaking a very extensive underwater and uh, flying over the reef survey. So if you if you tune into the um, Centre for Coral Research at, at James Cook University, it's the Centre of Excellence for, for Coral Reefs, uh, tune into their website. You'll see reports coming through right now. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority is also undertaking surveys. And within the coming months, they will return data and figures, and we'll find out what the extent is uh, across the whole reef. And these are the sorts of figures that I hope the federal government will pay attention to uh, and reverse their actions based on those figures, because as I mentioned, I think they're going to be a lot worse than we initially predicted. Um, but unfortunately, it does take months of people working. You know, the Great Barrier Reef is this huge structure. It's, you can't just go outside and look at it. Um, it's going to take months for those those numbers to come through. Uh, by the time they're finalized, then 
the reef will be going you know, one way or the other, um, and we need to do our best to help it go in the right direction. Well, Justin Marshall, I, uh, I wish we were speaking about happier news, and I, I hope this is a, a wake-up call to the sense of urgency that we need to have. Thanks for your work, and, and thanks for talking to us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for the time, and thanks for listening, uh, everyone who is listening. And you know, please get out there and talk to people and do as much as you can about it. That was my conversation with Justin Marshall, a professor at the University of Queensland and the founder of Coral Watch, a nonprofit where citizens are given tools to help monitor the health of coral reefs worldwide. Professor Marshall is also the co author of the book Coral Reefs and Climate Change. And that's it for The Elephant This Time. The Elephant is made with support from the Climate Kick, that's KIC Alumni Association. It's a community of entrepreneurs and young professionals working on creating a climate resilient society. You can find out more at ckaa.eu. Our website is elephantpodcast.org, where you can find out how to get in touch with us and how to subscribe to the podcast. And to keep up to date, you can like our page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at elephantpodcast. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you soon.